It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is uh, to the Premier. Ontario families are continuing to deal with the crisis in our long-term care homes. 1,792 seniors have lost their lives. Six more homes uh, are reporting outbreaks. Last week, the Premier told a reporter asking about long-term care, and I quote, we didn't fail. We've thrown every tool we've had at these long-term care homes. Speaker, does the Premier truly believe that his government made no mistakes and that his government truly did everything they could when it comes to protecting seniors in long-term care? Recognize the Premier to reply. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I can sit here and say, yes, truly, we threw everything we possibly could at it. Absolutely everything. When we ended up getting calls about outbreaks, we sent hospitals in there. We did have inspections for over 3,000 over the, the prior year. We made sure the military came in to the really red, red homes. And I'll give you an update from May the 28th, Mr. Speaker. We had uh, 2,589 cases. That's a combination of residents and staff. June the 12th, now the total confirmed cases is 1,154. Still, that, that's a high number, Mr. Speaker. But what is good, good news, and we're getting there, and we still have a tremendous amount of work, we went from 123 outbreaks in long-term care homes with 120, uh, 172 long-term care homes resolved down to 63 long-term care Response. outbreaks and 238 long-term care homes resolved. Uh, we're putting every resource we have at these long-term care homes, and if the opposition Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I've sent many over, and unfortunately, they go unanswered. Having said that, there are almost 1,800 people who have lost their lives in long-term care to COVID-19. This morning, I spoke with Maureen McDermott, whose mother resides in the for-profit River Glenhaven long-term care facility in York Simcoe, where 20 residents have died from COVID-19. She began raising the alarms about the state of care in that home back in April, filing formal complaints with the government after staff repeatedly hung up on her when she called to get updates on her mother, desperate for information. And for weeks, the government refused to take over that facility. Can the Premier honestly tell Maureen that his government did everything they possibly could have done to protect seniors in this home? Premier. Well, my, my heart breaks for Maureen and, and families uh, like Maureen. No one wants to see deaths. It doesn't matter what political stripe you come from, no matter if it's, again, from the Orange Party, Blue Party, or Red Party, or Green Party. Everyone is doing their best to make sure we resolve cases. We have enough PPEs within 24 hours. If a home's out of PPE, we end up sending it over immediately. Again, we send hospitals in there to take care of it, take care of the, uh, the homes. We've, we've actually, we've brought in hospitals and we've taken a license off one home and we've brought in hospitals in to run the entire home, uh, numerous of them, numerous uh, homes when we see the cases escalate. But again, Mr. Speaker, we are doing everything possible Response. in our power, sparing not a penny, to make sure we resolve these, these issues that we're seeing in long-term care homes, and we're making uh, headway. The numbers show it. They, they prove it. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, families like Maureen's have been pleading with the Premier to take action for months, and instead, he kept control in the hands of for-profit operators. In April, while the Premier was telling families there was an iron ring around long-term care facilities, the administrator of that facility was telling local reporters, and I quote, we can only isolate to a certain degree because all the residents on the second floor are wanderers. There was no iron ring at Glen Haven, or River Glen Haven, Speaker. No iron ring. And the Premier either knew that or he wasn't doing his job. Will the Premier now admit that his government did fail and apologize to Maureen and thousands of families like hers? Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, again, my heart breaks for Maureen and so many other 
other families that have gone through this tragedy. And it's not just here in Ontario. We've seen it around the world. We've seen it in our, our neighbours uh, to the east of us in, in Quebec. And again, we're, we're putting every single resource we have. And it's a, a terrible tragedy. But what has gone on for decades under the previous government, under the, the NDP propping up the previous government, they never did anything, nothing at all. We are going to fix the problem that we inherited that have been around for decades, absolutely decades, but this is coming to an end. We're going to fix the problem moving forward for good. It's very simple. All the other governments talk a lot, Response. Mr. Speaker, but they did absolutely nothing, including the opposition party stood by for decades and didn't do anything. We're doing something now. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Her, uh, my next question is also for the Premier, and unfortunately, a broken heart isn't good enough for all of those seniors who have lost their lives in long-term care. In fact, other governments right here in Canada took early action to respond to COVID-19 in long-term care. The results show those actions were faster and better than Ontario's. British Columbia intervened in March to take control of for-profit long-term care homes that weren't coping with outbreaks, and in March took control of staffing to ensure that staff would work at one facility and have the proper equipment to protect themselves and residents. Back in March, Speaker. BC at this point has seen 168 seniors lost to COVID-19 in long-term care homes. Almost 1,800 have died in Ontario's long-term care homes. Why was Ontario unable to actually forge an iron ring around long-term care like BC, in fact, did? The Premier, well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I, I love how the Leader of the Opposition uh, uses BC all the time. I have a great deal of respect for Premier Horgan. I consulted with him numerous times and continue to consult with him. But what, what the Leader of the Opposition is missing, they're one-third our size. They were a month earlier than we were. Have we all learned a lot of lessons? Absolutely, we've learned a lot of lessons. And that's the first step, is am admitting where there's cracks in the ship. And we saw massive cracks in the ship. There's no denying it. I was a, I was a first one to come out and say there's massive uh, cracks in the ship, and that's why we've asked for an independent commission. We need answers. Uh, we aren't sh shying away from problems in long-term care. We're tackling these problems. We're meeting them head-on, unlike previous governments that have totally ignored them, swept them underneath the car Response. Carpet. And I don't look at it as profit or non-profit. I look at all long-term care homes equally because they all have the most vulnerable people at the homes, and we're going to fix this problem, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. A supplementary question. Well, to fix the problem, you have to admit that you had one, Speaker, and I think this Premier still refuses to acknowledge that they should have moved more swiftly and more decisively when it came to our vulnerable seniors in long-term care. For months, the Premier ignored pleas from frontline uh, workers who were calling on the government to intervene and take control of failing for-profit homes. For months, those pleas were ignored, Speaker. And for months, the Ford government insisted that it just wasn't necessary, that these for-profit homes were protected by an iron ring that really didn't exist, and that such takeovers would not even be possible under Ontario's system. That's what the Premier was saying, Speaker. The Premier says Ontario did not fail our seniors. Why did this government fail to take decisive action other provinces did and instead leave control of long-term care in the hands of operators who are now being investigated for potentially criminal le levels of negligence? The Minister of Long-Term Care to respond for the government. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite for, the, for this important question. Looking across the globe, long-term care homes and our most vulnerable people in society have been tragically affected by COVID-19. There is no doubt. We must all acknowledge that. It is fact. Looking across Ontario, even at the peak of our COVID outbreak, 70% of our homes were not in outbreak. And most of the time, 80%. So my heart breaks for everyone who's been affected by this terrible virus and our most vulnerable people. Our government did act swiftly, and I know there is a narrative out there 
about inspections, about not taking action. We acted early. We acted early on some of the measures earlier than some of the other provinces. We have a geographic dis difference. We have a population difference. And every measure and every tool has been used and will be used. Calling in hospital teams, infection prevention and response teams, additional staffing with portals, our hospital integration. We're looking at a, a integrated process forward to rejuvenate long-term care. We will fix this problem. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier's words were, quote, we didn't fail. But nobody believes him because he did. He failed. The Premier failed to listen to Maureen and others when they told him that their loved ones weren't safe at River Glen Haven. He failed to read the emails from women like Kathy Parks, who was sounding the alarm bell about abuse and neglect at Orchard Villa. Will the Premier now admit that his government, in fact, did fail and apologize to Maureen and thousands of other families like hers? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. Looking at families across Ontario, we understand the hardship that they have faced during COVID-19. COVID-19 has been a challenge in many, many ways, and we acknowledge that. Our homes have been supported. We've taken measures left, right, and centre, and we will continue to take measures as we move forward. When we look at the funding that we put forward very early to make sure our homes could have more uh, cleanliness, more sanitization, we've had our inspectors in there on an ongoing basis as soon as they could go in safely. In fact, our homes have had in-person inspections on a regular basis, despite the narrative from uh, other, other uh, corners. The truth is, we Response. have taken responsible actions, swift and decisive actions, over and over again, and we will continue to do that. It is our number one priority to keep our long-term care residents safe. Thank you. <laughs> next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, kindly Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Across the world, governments are fundamentally reevaluating the state of policing in their communities. Hundreds of thousands of people have marched in the streets demanding, uh, demanding systemic change and action to address anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism. In less than two months, three Black Ontarians have died during interactions with police. Regis korchinski Piquet, DeAndre Campbell, and Caleb Tubilia, Tubila Njoko all lived with mental health issues. They were loved, and they should be with us today. No one should die after calling 911 for help. What is the Premier's plan to address this urgent call from communities for fundamental change to policing in Ontario? The Solicitor General to reply for the government. Thank you very much. You know, I think we all understand and recognize that policing and community safety has changed in the last number of years. The issues faced today by police services and our communities they serve are increasingly complex. As part of our government's $174 million commitment to address mental health and addiction in fiscal year 2019-20, the Ministry of Solicitor General and the Ministry of Health announced $18.3 million in new funding to support those affected by mental health and addiction challenges in the justice sector. This includes $6.95 million for new mobile crisis teams with dedicated safe beds and transitional case managers. You know, Speaker, I think we all understand that when Response. almost 40% of police calls are interacting with individuals who have mental health or addiction issues, we need to do things differently, and that's why our government has made such a strong commitment to mental health and addiction. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, for decades, governments ignored the crisis uh, of communities, whether it's the Liberals' failure to act on recommendations from the Roots of Youth Violence report, which they commissioned, or the Ford government's decision to roll black back police oversight, cut millions from anti-racism and education programs, and axe 30 
rather $335 million in mental health funding. Tackling systemic racism requires real action. The, SE, uh, the SIU must include public independent oversight. We need to truly end carding, and we have to fix the imbalance between policing costs and armed crisis response versus meagre investments in community supports and mental health rollbacks that this government has made. Will the Premier commit to take these long overdue first steps to address systemic racism in the province of Ontario? Again, the Solicitor General reply. You know, Speaker, there are so many parts of that statement, it's not really a question, um, that I could delve further into. But let's start with the anti-racism directorate. There has been zero change in the amount of budget that they have done. And frankly, they have done some incredible things already, including mediating partnerships between the Hamilton-Wentworth District School Board and the Hamilton Centre for Civic Inclusion to support black youth in Hamilton-Wentworth District, District School Board. I would have thought that the um, member opposite would have known about that since it was in Hamilton. We've supported the Toronto District School Board and the Children's Aid Society of Toronto to address anti-black racism in their respective organizations. The Anti-Racism Directorate has supported Durham Region School Board with developing anti-black racism training for kindergarten Response. teachers. And there are so many things that we are doing at the Ontario Police College to make sure that our frontline police officers, who are doing very challenging work during challenging times, have the training and the skills needed and necessary to make sure that we serve all of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Premier, last week, many Ontarians were relieved to hear that case numbers had dropped and that many parts of Ontario could reopen. Yesterday, even more of Ontario was told that businesses both big and small could reopen. This news is encouraging for everyone in the legislature, my constituents, and all Ontarians in those regions and across our great province. It would also be a relief for businesses who have been closed for a number of months and can finally reopen and support their local communities. Will the Premier please tell us more about what these announcements mean for the people and the businesses of our great province? The Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Milton. As always, he's doing an incredible job out in Milton. When when I stood in front of Ontario last week, I announced our plan to reopen Ontario. I wanted my message to be clear. We support you, and we will get through this together. And that's the reason we see the numbers uh, come all the way down like this. It's because of the people of Ontario. We announced that 24 regions were going to open up last week. Yesterday, we announced another seven more regions uh, that are opening up, uh, Mr. Speaker. And hopefully, in a very short while, we'll announce that we'll be able to open up Windsor, Essex. We'll be able to open up Toronto and Peel. We understand, but we're always going to listen to the health and science first. Response. And we, we've seen the numbers come down. We're confident numbers are going to continue coming down, Mr. Speaker. We had over 24,000 tests. Again, the numbers of COVID cases are down. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the Premier for the answer and for his great leadership. It is always encouraging to hear that Ontarians are coming together and ensuring we can all get back to work sooner. I am proud to work, and I want to also thank the dedication, the leadership that my constituents have shown during these difficult times, Mr. Speaker. But I know that we need to keep public health in mind when we approach our reopen. Case numbers and testing are critical factors when it comes to assessing what stage we can move into. Can the Premier tell us more about what has been done to get us even closer to stage two, a province-wide reopening, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. Premier. Th thank you again to the member of Milton. I want to be clear, the public health trends across the province are headed in the right direction. They're actually headed in such a, a great direction that we have the lowest cases against any region in North America 
at states our size, province, I guess most comparable would be Quebec, but we have the lowest cases per 100,000 in all of North America. So the system is working, Mr. Speaker. Our, our plan is working. The people are supporting the plan. And it's amazing when everyone's pulling in the same direction, Mr. Speaker, it's amazing how much work you get done. Rather than playing politics and nittering back and forth, I have an idea. Why, don't, why, why doesn't the opposition support us on some of these ideas? Come out and help us. Just like their federal counterparts, the federal Liberals were working like this together. Calls every single day, working together, see how we can Response? Uh, source more PPE, how they can support each other. That's what we need in this province. We don't need the bickering and the fighting constantly when this problem has, has just happened over the last five, six months. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brampton East. My question is to the Premier. DeAndre Campbell was a 26-year-old black man from Brampton. He was suffering from a mental health crisis, so he decided to call the police. He didn't just survive that phone call. He was tased twice and shot and killed by police in his own home. Now, two months later, the officer who killed DeAndre Campbell has not had to answer a single SIU question about what happened. And because this premier has delayed legislation that it would have required officers to participate in investigations, there's nothing the SIU can do to bring this officer to the table. This complete failure of accountability lies squarely at the feet of this government. Enough is enough. We need justice. Will the Premier act now to fix our broken SIU so that this officer and every officer involved in police killings is investigated so justice can be served? The Attorney General to reply for the government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for, for the question. Public safety is a top priority for our government. We're committed to providing the frontline police officers with the tools and the resources they need and the supports they need to keep the community safe. That's why the government passed the, the act that you referenced, the Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act, the COPS Act. It'll work to help the people of Ontario, it'll help frontline policing, it'll help policing partners. It also provides for some oversight, Mr. Speaker. The SIU is an independent body that, that does work to make sure that uh, matters are investigated uh, without political interference. And, and as such, Mr. Speaker, obviously I can't comment on any particular case, but I, I rest assured that the system is independent, that it's structured with the tools that it needs, and will continue to do its job. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is also for the Premier. Calls for reform to police oversight have echoed unanswered in this province for years. From protests in the street to expert reports, no one has been able to convince this government or the Liberal government before it that black lives matter enough to change the law and make it stick. While the Premier takes turns denying the problem exists or of delaying solutions, the families of DeAndre Campbell, of Regis Korchinski Paquet, and of far too many other Black Ontarians seek answers knowing they can't depend on the SIU to find the answers for them. My question is simple. Will the Premier commit today to reform the SIU and police oversight in Ontario without delay. Again, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I, thank, I thank the other member for, for the question. And we, we have been, been adjusting the way that oversight works, Mr. Speaker. We have not adjusted the independence, and we have not adjusted the arm's length nature of it, but we have adjusted the tools that they have, and we will further strengthen the already independent and effective police oversight. The, the COPS Act includes a new standalone Community Safety uh, Policing Act. It, it will, when in force, rename the OI. PRD as well, the Law Enforcement Complaints Agency, and started a new legal framework for that agency. Mr. Speaker, we are proactively, again, picking up the pieces left by the previous Liberal government, and we are making sure that the system works more effectively than it has in a very long time. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Systemic racism has always existed in Ontario, but many are just beginning to understand and appreciate just how deep and how entrenched it is in our society and our institutions. 
When our public school system was founded by Egerton Ryerson, it included residential schools for Indigenous children. It underfunded and segregated schools for black students. Higher education at the time was only reserved for boys. Racism is not inevitable. It is designed. It is learned. Addressing systemic anti-black racism early in our education system will remove barriers to success for black students. Will the Premier today instruct his Minister of Education to mandate the true history of black Canadians be taught as a mandatory part of Ontario's education curriculum? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, obviously this government takes uh, anti-black racism uh, very seriously, as I, as I know all members of this uh, House uh, do. We have been uh, uh, as concerned as anybody has with uh, the events that have occurred over the last uh, number of weeks, uh, not only uh, across uh, North America. I will take uh, the members' comments under advisement and make sure that, uh, uh, that they are forwarded to the Minister of Education. At the same time, uh, the member will know that uh, the Premier worked very quickly to uh, uh, prior to this in December and appointed Jamil Giovanni to uh, uh, to advance uh, opportunities in the community mr. speaker uh, I'm sure the member opposite will agree that he is a very passionate uh, uh, voice and uh, somebody that I know members on this side of the house are uh, anxious uh, to work with uh, uh, mr. speaker as I said I will take the members recommendations and for that to the Minister of Education the supplementary question thank you speaker and back to the premier Premier, we heard in this House that this government will not tolerate any racism in its government. But, Premier, the urgency is here. Lives and futures are at stake. We know that systemic racism cannot be rooted out until we understand how deep it truly goes in this province. Despite this knowledge, this government is still underfunding and hindering the work of the anti-racism directorate. You are ignoring the tools that are there to address this problem. Other provinces, like Quebec, have set up an action committee to combat racism. Yet Ontario has only provided the words without meaningful action. And we must work together to change the outcomes for Black, Indigenous and people of colour in this province. So my question to you, Premier, is will you support the creation of an all-party committee to take action on the many dozens of reports that have been presented about the issue of anti-black racism in this province. Will you do that today, Premier? Yes or no? Minister Children, Community and Social Services. To well, thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite for the question. Uh, what we have done here on this side is we've introduced a new council. A couple of weeks ago, Jamil Giovanni will be heading up that council, and it's called the Premier's Council on Equality of Opportunity, which is focused on making sure that there are mentors uh, for individuals in the communities that the member opposite referenced, but not only mentors, uh, there's a game plan, Mr. Speaker, and Jamil is putting together the council right now. Uh, they have until Thursday to uh, put their name forward to be a member of this council, which is actually going to make a substantial difference in the lives of these individuals. Working with our partners that we already fund in this sector, we have 50 different members in the Black Youth Action Plan, Mr. Speaker, that our ministry and other ministries are funding. Black-led groups, uh, for the most part, Mr. Speaker, that uh, will be expanded as a result of uh, financial uh, incentives that were announced a couple of weeks Response. ago to the tune of about one and a half million dollars to ensure that we're getting better outcomes and creating better opportunities for uh, members of these communities across the province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oakville. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sports, Tourism and Culture Industries. Mr. Speaker, while sitting on the Standing Committee of Finance and Economic Affairs, I had the opportunity to listen to tourism and attraction owner-operators who are looking for support and investments to help with future planning and marketing initiatives following COVID-19. I know the Minister has been speaking to stakeholders frequently to listen to their concerns and collect invaluable real-time data that has helped guide her ministry to provide investments and supports that will provide much-needed relief to the $36 billion tourism industry. Mr. Speaker, we know that our government and this minister are listening to Ontario's tourism operators. In fact, at a committee, Ms. Debbie Zimmerman, CEO of the Great Growers of Ontario, said, quote, 
I want to begin by thanking the Government of Ontario for being accessible and responsive to our needs and for pivoting quickly in these unprecedented times. Question. Can the Minister please update the House what our government is doing to directly support tourism operators to ensure they're getting the absolute best, they'll be in the best position to welcome back visitors when it is safe to do so again? Thank you. Mr. Perry, Sport, Tourism, Culture, Industries. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Oakville for his question. Also, his leadership. Uh, he recently chaired a meeting for me with the Regional Tourism Organization in Hamilton, Halton, and Brant. He's also been a leader on the Standing Committee of uh, Finance and Economic Affairs as we do a sector-led uh, initiative with, re with respect to tourism and hospitality. And I have to say, as a member, a long-standing member in this legislature uh, for the past 14 years, 140 different pres presenters appeared before that committee. That is unprecedented. We have held six telephone town halls with well over 1,200 stakeholders in each one of them. We have retooled the Tourism uh, Development and uh, Recovery Fund. We've tripled that uh, funding. We have flowed $9 million already for festivals that aren't able to continue, but we want to see them back in 2021. In the member's own riding, we've uh, flowed over $875,000 through the Ontario Trillium Foundation. And as of today, we will be flowing $350,000 dollars in marketing funding because of the hard work of that member to his region. A supplementary question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and Minister. Great news. I'm uh, very happy to hear that. I know these measures and supports are greatly appreciated. Local investments go a long way in promoting the wonderful destinations and attractions that our communities and regions have to offer Ontarians, particularly as they may be considering a staycation with their friends and family this summer. Rick Lazell, CEO of the Ontario Boating Association, agrees, noting at committee that, quote, our, our tireless efforts are sincerely appreciated not only by our industry, but the thousands of Ontario families who are out there actively and safely boating today. Minister, can you please tell us how our government is continuing to support tourism operators throughout this summer season? Thank you. Thank you very Mr. much to the, to the member. Um, obviously, in terms of the economy, the hardest hit, the first hit, and the longest to recover will be our tourism, culture, and uh, sport industries. Uh, we are right now facing a triple threat on our spectacular double bottom line. I've often said in this House that we are responsible for the cultural fabric of the province of Ontario, but also $75 billion in economic activity. And unfortunately, we are now facing that triple threat. First, the public health crisis, second, the economic crisis, and now third, Third, the social crisis and trying to make sure consumer behavior is not inhibited, particularly as it pertains to our tourism and our culture sectors. That's why our government has announced just yesterday $13 million of marketing fund. $350,000 of that will go to this member's uh, riding, but we have continu continued to flow that money across the province. $1 million to Ottawa on Friday, $1 million to uh, Brockville and uh, Leeds-Grenville area on Saturday, over $350,000 in Muskoka on Sunday, and of course, Speaker, I'll be in Blue Mountain today and at Niagara Falls on Friday as we continue to support our tourism operators and those local communities. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier, Speaker. Since this government announced the child care reopening in this province without ever talking to any operators, any parents, ACEs, people who actually operate in, on the ground, people who actually need child cares, spaces without consulting with any of these people uh, they decided suddenly with a three days notice to open up child care centers since then we have heard from parents who are worried sick they're worried about the future of their children we've heard from parents who have been told that that fees are going up uh, we have been told that these parents who are already paying more than you no know, mortgage more than their rent we are now experiencing one of the highest childcare costs in this province, Speaker, and now these childcare costs will go up. We've also heard from essential workers, people who this Premier calls uh, our heroes, essential workers who are Question. afraid of losing their spaces. We're, we're hearing from frontline workers who are losing their emergency child care spaces and have no alternative. My question is, Mr. Speaker, will this government admit to the lack of a plan that's hurting families and step up with the funding need that child care needs and make the recovery easier and safer for everyone? Thank you, Speaker. The response, the government has stated. 
<clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as you know, uh, the minister worked very closely with the Chief Medical Officer of Health to put in place uh, a plan that would uh, support uh, our child care operators as, uh, as they began to reopen up. The member will know that while child care centres are allowed to reopen, they're not mandated uh, to reopen. They can only do so and should only do so when uh, their workers are safe and when the people that they're taking care of uh, are safe uh, as well, Mr. Speaker. To suggest that we didn't work with, uh, with, uh, with them is, is just simply wrong. As you know, this is an a very, a very important sector to us. It's important to the economy. Uh, as we start to reopen, we understand how important child care is uh, uh, for individuals who are returning to work. Uh, funding has been put in place to ensure that uh, child care centres do not increase uh, uh, the costs uh, to, uh, to parents, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to work very closely with the sector to make sure that our children are safe and, equally importantly, the people who provide the care are safe as well. Thank you. The member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Uh, the government's lack of a childcare plan is hurting families and childcare operators. Jeff, a supervisor at Friends Daycare in my riding, said the Conservatives' plan fails to address capacity issues, fails to address the increased cost of reopening, and fails to provide proper funding and direction for staffing. Premier, some childcare centres might never reopen. Premier, how can you expect childcare centres to provide childcare to parents so they can return to work if these childcare centres can't even afford to pay their own staff? Once again, the government house leader. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, as I just said, uh, we work very closely with the sector uh, uh, well in advance of the announcement uh, that uh, the sector could begin to open. As you know, that was, there was an emergency order put in place earlier on that uh, would uh, allow for essential. Uh, uh, essential workers to uh, have uh, the provision of childcare. We've advanced uh, some of those uh, sectoral guidance. Uh, the minister working closely with the chief medical officer of health, working with the minister of labour. We've put funding in place to ensure that the centres, when they do decide to open, can do so safely. Uh, we've uh, expressed uh, that it's important that all childcare workers uh, are tested. Uh, there's funding in place for PPE. There's funding in place for. Uh, for disinfecting. We will continue to work very closely with the sector, Mr. Speaker, because, as you know, uh, uh, as we begin to open up the economy, as the Premier announced earlier today, this is a very important sector, uh, and uh, we want to make sure that the people providing services Response. and the kids that they're taking care of are safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Last Friday, the Supreme Court of Canada, in a very uh, important historical uh, ruling, uh, said that Francophones across the country have the right to the same equality of teaching uh, that uh, uh, the English uh, uh, students. Uh, this is to deal with inequality and equality of government services that is offered uh, in both official languages. This inequality exists uh, elsewhere as well. It exists in the capacity of Franco Ontarians uh, to have access uh, to uh, legal aid in French. Uh, the bill, uh, 161, gives the possibility to correct uh, this inequality. Uh, so are you going to uh, take uh, this opportunity in order to guarantee that francophones and anglophones have access uh, to legal aid of quality, uh, equi equivalent quality in the official language of their choice, whatever, wherever they live in the province? Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Président. Je veux remercier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I want to thank the uh, OC and happy we birthday. Are to improve access to justice in French and Ontario, Mr. Speaker. This bill contains proposals, Bill 161, to improve the way the justice system operates every day to provide people faster, more affordable access to justice. And I'm very pleased that for the first time ever, the very first time ever, the proposed legislation would mandate Legal Aid Ontario to consider the needs of francophone individuals and communities when it is providing legal aid services. Our government is proposing this legislative change in recognition of the importance of ensuring Franco-Ontarians can access legal services in French. In addition to the legislative proposals related to the Legal Aid Services Act, the Smarter and Stronger Justice Act proposes amendments to the Class Proceedings Act to improve notice to class members by directing that the notices be published in both English and French. Mr. Response. Speaker, hardly something that we should have to do in this day and age, Mr. Speaker, but it wasn't happening and we're making it happen. It is our government's belief that this change will help ensure that Franco-Ontarians receive proper notice of class proceedings in which they may be eligible to participate. I'll have more to say in my supplementary. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
So I'm glad to hear what the minister has to say about the importance of francophone services. And I'm calling, of course, on the government to support my proposed amendment to Schedule 16 of Bill 61, which will protect equal rights for both francophones and anglophones in Ontario to access legal aid services in the official language of their choice. It's very important that these rights are recognized in equality. So will your government support this amendment during the clause-by-clause -clause review of Bill 161 tomorrow? And I would take that as a really great birthday gift. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and I, I thank the member opposite for, for the question. And the, the amendments uh, deadline was last night, so I have not had a chance to see them yet. Uh, certainly, we will review uh, all of the proposed amendments from, from the opposition parties uh, with, with this in mind, Mr. Speaker, with our commitment that every person in Ontario should have access to the justice system in the official language of their choice. Mr. Speaker, so I, I will look at the amendments, or the committee will look at the amendments, our government will look at the amendments uh, with, with that in mind. And uh, I want to thank you for working with us uh, through, the, through the Justice Committee as it reviewed the bill and, and uh, as it goes clause by clause this week. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Young people are the future in this province, but for decades, youth from disadvantaged communities have faced significant barriers to succeeding in our society and in our economy. We know these barriers aren't new, Mr. Speaker, and we know that in many cases, COVID-19 has made these issues far worse. At a time when Ontario is facing some of the most significant challenges in our history, we must do everything we can to equip the next generation of leaders in communities across this province with the skills necessary to overcome the social and economic barriers that they face. Minister, could you tell the House more about the recent announcement of the Premier's Council on Equality of Opportunity and the positive impacts this will have for youth in Ontario? Minister Children, Community and Social Services. Willowdale for the great question this morning. Our government is looking for a group of diverse leaders who will form our new Premier's Council on Equality of Opportunity. Uh, the Council will include young people between the ages of 18 and 29, also adults with expertise in areas such as community organizations, not-for-profits, and business and education. The Council is going to be chaired by Jamil Giovanni. Uh, he's the province's advocate for community opportunities, who the province was introduced to uh, just a couple of weeks ago by the Premier, and will work with the government to ensure that young workers, especially disadvantaged youth, have the opportunity to succeed in Ontario's rapidly changing economy. It'll engage directly with young people and communities across the province to identify strategies to address the challenges facing many young people today, such as completing an education or accessing stable employment. We're going to work Response. with our community partners, and there are many that we're working with in the Black Youth Action Plan, Women's Multicultural Resources Counseling Centre of Durham and the riding of the Minister of Finance, Goldilocks Productions, Interact. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. This uh, collaboration between young people and the leaders in our community is crucially important. With approximately 1 in 10 youth in Ontario between the ages of 15 and 24 not in work and not in education, it is more important than ever to challenge the status quo and connect our young people to employment and the right training and supports to help them succeed. That's why the work of this council is going to be crucially important, and it's going to be important that they move quickly and decisively, Mr. Speaker. I'm hoping the minister, through you, are you able to tell us more about what our government and the Premier's Council on Equality of Opportunity uh, will do to start addressing the barriers that prevent young people from succeeding in their full potential here in Ontario? Minister. Thanks again to the member uh, from Willowdale for the question, and thank you, Speaker. Uh, our government recognizes that the impact that COVID-19 and the outbreak in our province is having and the need to move quickly uh, to address some of those concerns and to take action, Speaker. And that's why we announced $1.5 million in funding to organizations like some of the ones that I mentioned earlier uh, that will provide urgent COVID-19 supports and address the immediate needs of black children, youth and families in the province. Moving forward, the Council's first priority will be to work collaboratively with government, with communities and young people to identify additional strategies to support 
vulnerable and marginalized youth to recover from the effects of the COVID-19 outbreak. I'd like to take this opportunity again to encourage all youth who are interested in being a voice for their community to apply before Spons. the June 18th deadline, that's Thursday, Mr. Speaker, and have the opportunity to advocate and provide insight to government as one of the Council's youth advocates. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Thank you. My question is to the government house leader. Good morning, sir. Speaker, as you know, good things grow in Ontario. But what people don't know or pay little attention to is that those who help ensure that good things grow aren't getting the basic supports and protection they need to keep themselves safe. Hundreds of migrant farm workers in southwestern Ontario are ill. Two young men have died, and still the government refuses to ensure these essential workers have the pandemic pay they deserve. Speaker, when will this government step up and help Ontario's agricultural community with a real plan for migrant workers fighting COVID-19? Government House Leader to respond for the government. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as you know, we worked uh, very closely. Let me just say I agree with the member. This is uh, obviously a very important sector. Uh, uh, my home of uh, my home uh, town of Markham Stouffville is uh, is home to uh, uh, many workers, and they do uh, very very. Uh, valuable work for the people of Ontario, but as you know, we've been working very closely with the agri-food sector to ensure that uh, resources have been put in place, that there is additional funding to ensure uh, uh, both the provision of PPE to increase and improve uh, uh, hygiene and sanitation uh, uh, standards uh, uh, on sites. I know at the same time, uh, the Minister of Labour uh, uh, had mentioned uh, uh, previously that uh, uh, over 60 site visits had been uh, had been. Uh, uh, or excuse me, over 200 site visits with over 60 orders, Mr. Speaker. The member is correct. It is a very important sector. That's why we're treating it uh, uh, as importantly as we are. We have put in place funding to, uh, to help uh, those farms that may need additional supports when it comes to housing, uh, and we will continue to do that work, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And the supplementary question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. My question is also to the Premier. Uh, not only is this government failing those who grow our food, but also fan the workers who helped ensure that throughout this crisis we had food on our table. The pandemic made clear that the vital work done by Ontario's frontline retail workers, um, but while some companies did step up with pandemic pay, that's now also being cut in the middle of the pandemic. And now workers are being told to make ends meet with a low minimum wage that this government also rolled back. Speaker, the pandemic didn't magically disappear this week. These workers still face threats every day. They are still heroes. And after putting their lives on the line for us month, for months, these workers deserve a paycheck that reflects their hard work and their sacrifice. We're now in a new normal. Workplaces have changed. The risks workers face every day have changed. Their jobs and responsibilities have changed. Going back to normal is not enough. Ontario needs real change to help recover from this crisis. The Question. Senior speaker, why won't this government step up for low-wage workers and the families that they support and increase our minimum wage? The government has stated. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, this government has been working right from the beginning to ensure that uh, the people uh, uh, who provide services in small, medium and large enterprises are well supported. That's why we've reduced taxes uh, across the sector. We've improved uh, uh, the, the standards, uh, workplace standards for uh, our employees, Mr. Speaker. Specifically uh, to the question of, uh, of migrant workers, we understand how important they are. Uh, to the agri-food sector in the province of Ontario. Frankly, we could not accomplish all that we do in this sector without them. That's why the Minister of Labour, working in consultation with the Minister uh, of, uh, of Agriculture, moved very quickly to ensure that there was sectoral, sectoral guidance in the sector. We provided additional funding to make sure that the health and safety of uh, these very valuable workers uh, uh, could be improved. There's been over 200 site visits, over 60 orders, Mr. Speaker. Uh, is there more to do? Absolutely. Is this a new normal? Response? Probably uh, for a long period of time. That's why the ministers will continue to work very closely with their partners to make sure that we enhance safety and security of the people who come here and do valuable work for the people of the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, before I get, uh, begin, I just want to give a very special shout out to my summer intern, Catherine Colbert, who I know is uh, watching live. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. COVID-19 and the need to shelter in place has shown our province how important it is that every Ontarian has a place to call home. And I'm proud that this minister is working to make that a reality. 
The various programs administered through his ministry are making a positive impact, not just for the people in my riding of Carleton, but for people across Ottawa and Ontario. Could the Honourable Minister please explain how this government has increased funding to our various housing initiatives and how they're making an impact through these unprecedented times? Thank you. Questions to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Carleton for the question and for her tremendous advocacy, uh, both in her riding and in the Ottawa area. Great job. Our, our government has uh, made it a priority, Speaker, to invest new money in our communities and to partner with the federal government on new projects. Uh, this year, my ministry invested $148 million to help our most vulnerable in response to COVID-19 through the Social Service Relief Fund. In 2020-2021, we are also investing an additional $55.7 million into programs like the National Housing Strategy and the Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative. In fact, this year, our government will invest close to $1 billion through our community housing renewal strategy to help build, uh, maintain, and uh, grow our community housing system in our That's province back. and to help people experiencing homelessness. Thank you, Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the honourable member for that response. Uh, you know, it's it's a team effort, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the reason I can uh, uh, advocate for the people in the area is because I'm supported and surrounded by such fantastic ministers like uh, Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, uh, Minister of uh, Health and Long-Term Care, and also Minister of Heritage, Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. Speaker, through you, we know that the federal government has renewed its interest in the housing space and made funds available through the National Housing Strategy. Could the minister explain how our government has partnered with the federal government to leverage these funds and continue to help Ontarians find homes? Great question. Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, again, Speaker, uh, another great question from uh, a great member. Uh, last December, Speaker, um, Federal Minister Hussein and I announced the signing of the $1.4 billion Canada-Ontario housing benefit. And I'm proud that our government was the first in Canada to sign this bilateral agreement under the National Housing Strategy. The Canada-Ontario housing benefit is a portable benefit, uh, and it will help Ontarians find homes in their communities that meet their needs and their budget. As of June 1, 1,600 families have already received direct assistance through this program, and by the end of the year, that number could grow to as many as 5,200 families. Over the nine years of the program, Speaker, more and more Ontarians will be helped each year, ensuring that we can continue to help low-income Ontarians stay close to their supports that here, they need. Here. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, it's been a rocky few months of emergency, distant, remote learning, uh, and we know that a return to in-class instruction this fall is not going to be easy. Students are going to need new supports. They're going to need mental health workers. They're going to need extra time with educational assistance, and they are going to need much smaller classes that allow for safe distancing. Schools are going to need PPE and more staff to do the extra cleaning. Yet despite all of those looming challenges, we are months overdue for school board funding, and frontline teachers and other education ministers are telling us they haven't even been consulted on any of the plans for reopening. Mr. Speaker, with the mess that this government has made in childcare reopening, how can we trust them to deliver a safe and orderly return to classes for Ontario's two million students? Government House Leader. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I guess uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic than the member opposite is. Uh, I think that uh, I think that our uh, our partners in education have done a wonderful job dealing with uh, the emergency that evolved uh, in COVID. I know that my kids have, uh, uh, well, not ideally, Mr. Speaker, but have been uh, online with their teachers quite often, doing their lessons and doing some great work, Mr. Speaker. So I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic. I'm a little bit more grateful for the hard work that our partners in education have done uh, dealing with the COVID crisis, Mr. Speaker. And I know that we will continue to work very closely with them. The minister, uh, in particular, uh, has been working uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with our partners in the education system to ensure that when kids do return to school, 
that it's done safely, that parents have the confidence that the schools that they return to will be safe, while at the same time making sure that we have resources Spons. in place should parents decide not to, uh, to send their kids back to school. I know the Minister of Infrastructure has been working to uh, increase broadband across the province. We will be ready because we have been ready and we will not fail our students. We never have and we never will. Member for Muskegawak, James Bay, the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Minister of Education likes to talk about using virtual resources to keep students engaged. But in Northern Ontario, students and teachers do not have access to the technology that makes that happen. Speaker, over 120,000 Northern Ontarians lack the access to reliable broadband, of which 70% resides in northeastern Ontario. And while the Minister of Education speaks of equitable access to education, two students in the remote James Bay Coast have to carefully use their limited, limited uh, bandwidth with, the sh uh, with share with health care, public service, and households. Speaker, to showcase virtual uh, resource with thousands of students in Northern Ontario who lack the technology to use them is contradictory at best. Can the Premier explain to students in Northern Ontario that do not have access to reliable internet at home what equitable access to education means? Again, the government house leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the member is, 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 is correct. We want to make sure that students across uh, the province of Ontario have access to the highest quality education system available. That is something that we've been working on since we came to government. I know that we have talked constantly about the disparity, disparity between urban and rural. It's something that we've been focused on. That's why the Minister of Infrastructure has been working so hard uh, to, uh, to bring forward a plan that would uh, increase broadband access uh, uh, across the province of Ontario. We get that, Mr. Speaker. That's why the Minister of Energy, for instance, has made sure that we've uh, brought down a, a hydro rate so that people can afford during this, different, uh, during this COVID crisis, Mr. Speaker. We understand this COVID crisis has happened and we're dealing with it uh, and the minister is working very closely uh, with his partners in northern Ontario with the boards in northern Ontario to make sure that the students there whether it's virtually whether it's through busing whether it's uh, a return to school that those kids have the best uh, quality education there should be no difference between urban and rural and that's what this government is focused on making sure that all kids have the best quality education well the next question the member for Sarnia Lambton Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. I'm proud that our government's been actively monitoring the impact of COVID-19 on Ontario's economy and taking action to support our job creators and workers. Ontario's forest industry is critical to the provincial economy and many northern and rural communities, generating over $18 billion in revenue and supporting approximately 155,000 direct and indirect jobs. This vital role this industry plays is especially evident during the COVID-19 outbreak, providing essential forest products for hygiene, food, and medical supplies, as well as packaging and shipping products. Can the minister update the House on how our government is supporting this sector and the part of the heart and soul of this great province? Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the great member from Sarnia Lambton for that question. As we safely and gradually reopen the province, our government is doing everything possible to support businesses and protect jobs. We recognize the importance of the forestry sector and the critical economic role that it plays, particularly in northern and rural communities. That's why my ministry moved quickly to ensure that the forestry sector was identified as an essential service. I recently committed, completed uh, virtual consultations with leaders from the sector. We discussed their issues and concerns as Ontario reopens the economy during the COVID-19 outbreak within guidelines from the Chief Medical Officer of Health. We're working with our partners to understand what's needed to protect and support people and our economy as we move forward. I will have more to say in the supplementary. Oh, thank you. Read. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Minister. And it's great to hear that our forestry sector, with your leadership, is stepping up to the plate and helping Ontarians get through this outbreak. I was not surprised to learn that the forestry companies have donated N95 masks to local hospitals and emergency service teams, and they've even hired new employees to assist in their efforts during the COVID-19 outbreak. Something I know the people of Ontario and our government are committed to is protecting our environment. We want to be responsible stewards of the land in order to preserve our beautiful natural environment for generations to come. Wood products are a renewable resource, and the industry works hard to ensure that forests are sustainably managed 
for the well-being of the ecosystem, our economy, and our own enjoyment. Minister, how are we helping the industry maintain its emphasis on sustainability during this difficult time? Minister. Well, thank you again, Speaker, and thank you again to the great member from Sarnia-Lambton. And you know, our industry stepped up to the plate, and our government is stepping up to the plate as well. They stepped to the plate, up to the plate, ensuring the sustainability of our forests through reforestation, which is a key principle of Ontario's forest management system. Our government has made $3.5 million available to help put protective measures in place for workers who plant trees this season. This will help the industry expand existing facilities and modify operations to ensure that those helping to renew Ontario forests can work in a safe environment during the COVID-19 outbreak. With these measures, we're also securing the planting of 70 million trees this year wow. in Ontario forests. During these unprecedented Bunts. times, our government is committed to supporting the forest industry and the communities that depend on it by protecting forestry workers Mike and forestry Mike. and ensuring forestry Mike. workers' safety. Thank you. And I hope the opposition will join us in supporting. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. There is nothing more important than a family knowing their loved ones are safe while Niagara reopens for the second phase this week. In St. Catharines, Jennifer's mother is receiving home care. She is concerned that the local for-profit home care she, uh, she, provider she has um, are adhering to weak PPE guidelines and only providing one mask per day for her mom's PSW. The same PSW can visit up to 10 homes each day. That's the same amount of masks, Mr. Speaker, that McDonald's offers to their employees for one shift. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, if it was your family member receiving home care from a PSW, would you feel comfortable knowing that they were being, their PPE was being reused and the same mask throughout the day while, visit, while the P PSW was visiting multiple residents and different homes? Would you feel comfortable? The Minister of Health replied. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. As part of our comprehensive plan to build healthier communities and to uh, end hallway health care, we are modernizing our system of home and community care to bring it into the 21st century. That being said, we know that people who are doing these visitations, be they whether they're nurses, personal support workers, or whomever they are, need to have the appropriate personal protective equipment in order to be able to do that for their own safety and for the safety of the people that they're caring for. That has been one of the issues that we've been dealing with throughout. COVID-19 is ensuring a safe and steady supply of PPE, but we've had Ontario companies that have stepped up to the plate to assist us, and they are doing things like manufacturing gowns, hand sanitizers, face masks, and everything else in between. We are supplying amounts to the home and community care suppliers that they need. If they need further supplies, they can contact us and we will send it to them within a day. So there should be no necessity for anybody having to re-wear a mask to many, many uh, community uh, people that they see in the community. That is something that we said from the beginning, was to prepare and protect the health and safety of all Ontarians, and we're continuing to do so, especially with respect to the provision of pandemics, uh, uh, PPE for pandemic purposes. We have it in our warehouse. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.